What you're looking at is the oldest of the pieces here in this exhibition. This piece has been to England, to Kansas City, yeah, plus this, this, uh, this drama show, plus others. So it's the most kind of exhibited piece that, that I've ever had, actually. Um, it comes in three sections, because we always have to take into account. Here's one section. There, one end, and this is the other end. Uh, we have why, why, why did this come in three sections? Anybody? Some shipping? Why, why does this have to be, why would why couldn't this come as a single unit? Why does it have to come in three? Section. There's one section, there's the middle, and then to transport it. Got it. <laughs> to transport it, to put it in an elevator, to put it through a door. So we have to think about that always. And all of our pieces are like a puzzle that gets put together uh, after we decrate it. Uh, and also just to create it. Really, there's very few forklifts that would actually manage to lift something like this. So all of that has to be taken into account. But that, my guys do it so I don't have to worry so much about it because this still feels like a single unit. That's all I care about, that the end result feels like a single unit. So I made the wooden part first, uh, and I made it for an exhibition at Exit Art, which is a place that existed in New York City for many, many years. That, that this exhibition had to do with sound. Now, I mean, it's not as though I'm not interested in sound, but I have no clues. You know, there are people who really know about manipulating sounds. I have no clues about this. So I did this in a very primitive way. If you put your voice, if you're standing in the middle of that, and if your voice spoke to the bottom of the bowl, it reverberates and echoes very differently as your voice goes up. And you can almost feel that right from the middle. You can almost feel that there's a greater distance and there's a greater sort of, uh, if anyway, there's a different sound as your voice gets, goes, goes, uh, goes up. Uh, I then made niches for all of these guys, all of these little, uh, I don't know what the uh, They're almost like little holes, little nests. And it's the side grain here that the little nests get lost a little bit because of the side grain and I not being able to sort of dig in as deeply as I can with the end for me. But that's kind of my point. These are made also out of the horse stomach of the cow. And I have a sack that I made of muslin, this hand sewn sack that I put. Uh, um, soil into, but really I put peat moss, which is a very light soil, because the intestines really can't hold anything, because I told you they were very fragile. So I put peat, peat moss in the, in the muslin sack, and then I put like a string around to tie onto another sack. Then I put the intestine around it. And, uh, uh, I actually had my grandchildren <laughs> help me so um, I, I kind of feel like it's a great thing to expose them to, to a lot of stuff. Anyway, after the intestines were sewn, while they were still wet, I, I put my hand in a little bit of graphite, then I put it on the surface while they were still wet so that it could really sink into the skin of this intestine. And hence you have this. They're extremely fragile. You know, and very fragile. So we take them off with each exhibition. We have a special way of having them. Put them back on with each exhibition. We mark them so we can fill in exactly the same place. And I keep, you know, replacing some that, uh, that have a harder time than others. But I like the kind of dance that they do. You see the little loops when you don't even see the intestine. Uh, and 
hence the, the thinking behind pairing them off uh, and the dancing on the surface. And it's really one of my most primitive pieces. And I don't even know what that word primitive means, but uh, I feel like it came from some other culture, some other place. Um, any questions about this piece? How are they attached? They're attached with itty, I'm so glad you can't see it. They're attached with itty bitty nails that we paint black to match the black of the uh, intestine. Oh, my question is, I was looking at this end in terms of the hollowed out area and what was her technique or her process for keeping the top part from collapsing down. In this case, it was a piece of cake. <laughs> it's not always that. A C shape that is glued the way we glue, which is very, very firm knit seams will always stand up, no problem. But I did cheat, I had to cheat a little bit. I wanted this open right here. I didn't want to seal this, but I had to give it this, this support in order for the very thing you're talking about. I couldn't have gone on forever and had the seam hold up. I had to put this support, and I try to make it visual as quiet, you know, visually as quiet as I possibly could. But here is my sin, right? Here. <laughs> <laughs> so you see the spoon? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Would you address the relationship between your media and the scale? I mean, you don't like to make little models; it'd be tough to do with toothpicks. <laughs> but this work. You're using and fighting with big pieces of wood. Somehow, this tells me where else to go. I can't imagine a toothpick doing that. You know, when I finished cutting this, and as I told you, I started to begin here. You know, once I have this, I have a clue as to what this, this line needs. Once I put this on, I have another clue to what this line needs. That, that could never happen in a model, you know, so it would be completely futile. And then look what happens to the back wall. Look how, how sort of uneven and, and <coughs> sort of complex. It's not really a back wall, but I'm just calling it. I can see uh, that it. That it just gives me a, another important thing here is how it, uh, well, I guess maybe you can see from this side. Okay, so let's see if I'm going to look what I did. Look what I did with these scenes. You see these scenes, this scene, this scene, this scene, this scene, this scene, this scene. It just shifts ever so slightly. You know, so the, so the head of that movement gets reiterated. But that, that again, kind of that slow, dignified movement. You know, it would be like a scale of the fish and it's shifting ever so slightly when they, just when they twist or when they turn it. So did you deliberately cut in there? I was cutting you know, it off. I glued it. You glued it. You glued it. Back the to we glued it off seam. Oh, so that part of the seam would be, but I also cut it this way, so the part of the seam would stick out. I did it, you know, on the side and at the top. You know, yes, you know, it's not like an accordion, but it's kind of, you know, again, it implies movement. Um, why is movement important? I don't even know that. I just know that imbuing the work with a specific energy, you know, an energy that you can embrace. I mean, 
These fingers, you know, and I draw on exactly where the flat part should come. I draw on where the indentures are. So every single piece, I draw exactly the profiles on all four sides of where it should be cut. But to cut these things, I have a guy that comes from Tucson, Arizona, that comes every other uh, month who is just a fantastic cutter, and he's a lyrical cutter. I have cutters who are aggressive cutters, and I have cutters that, but, you know, I sound like I have this huge team. I have two guys that are with me permanently always, and I have this one who comes every other month. That's it, you know, that's who makes all of this work. And I'm a fanatic about controlling all of the visuals of the work. Um, but anyway, he cut this very beautifully, and the top, Again, it curves a little to the right, comes out. It's very important, again, for the life, for the energy of this piece. 
that it scoops away from the wall, scoops away from the wall at the top. And there's a little dot there, a little, not a dot, but fingers, little itty bitty fingers at the very, at the very top. Not that, that's everything. But. And then, if you, yeah. All circular saw? All circular saw. Um, not chainsaw. Chainsaws are monsters. You know, they eat away a quarter of an inch. They're very crass. They're, you can't get anything this delicate in the chainsaw. Nothing like this. So come over here and we'll take a look at. This piece, too, I think looks better on this wall than it did at any other uh, institution, any other museum. Uh, in my head, these are kind of plates. Obviously, they're not plates. But um, I've had uh, a, it's not just a reputation, it's really true. I've made many, many bowls and many sort of farmers uh, implements, but they're really not implements, and they don't belong to farmers, and they're not very really utilitarian. You know, they, they're sort of a, a myth, my myth behind a plate. Uh, and I made this one first, and can you, can you maybe tell me why this one was first, or how you can tell by the visuals that this one was first? You'd have more control on that one, it seems. Okay, so she said I had more control on right. that one. Right. And, and, that's, uh, and that's true. With this one, there was less certainty. You know, there was like, I was floundering. And hence, you know, I think you see some of it in the way the, the edges were done and maybe in the way the bottom part was done. And in this one, I was more certain. And it really kind of pissed me off that I got so sure of myself because you're not, if it, you know, to not have the vulnerability of all that groping makes the piece actually not as interesting. So, um, but I liked this one so much that I had to make another one. So I did, and I don't need to put this one down because it's so much <laughs> This is, you know, this has things that are a little bit more complex that are going on. But with this stuff down here, I actually was going down all the way, going down to spilling onto the floor, and I just stopped, or slow stop. So, um, anyway, any comments about this, these two? Okay, we'll look at this. Uh, and when you wash it, 
the water expands it. You know, same thing that happens to your stomach, you know, especially if you drink warm water. You know, your stomach feels good and relaxed, you know, it, 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 it relaxes the intestine. I, I'm only saying this because um, I get them in five gallon buckets. I order them in the intestines and then I wash the salt off because the only way that they can keep them preserved is by bathing them in salt. I wash the salt off because otherwise it crystallizes on your surface and if you don't want that, you can have it. And the salt keeps eating away at it, which I can't afford, you know, in a piece. This piece is almost 20 years old. You know, it yellowed a little bit more, but I, I like the yellowing. Uh, it has epoxy on the top because it couldn't have survived otherwise. It would have shrunk from more and more. Uh, and the epoxy prevents the air from getting in and the funguses from eating it up and the bacteria and all of that. So, but still, if somebody poked a finger through it like this, it would get a hole and it would ruin the piece. So it's still vulnerable. It still has a thin layer. Uh, <clears throat> so this is, you know, a piece that I made a paddle for that's corrugated paddle of cedar. And I made each of the teeth kind of different. You know, they're like a family of teeth that just keep being a little bit different. Like, like, like your teeth are all different from one another. And I, I love the what like what the skin does over the rib cage. Not that this is what this is, but that these shadows are very important. You know, in sort of playing with the edges of the piece in different ways. So it's a piece that's kind of more delicate, maybe. You know, than some of the other pieces that I made in part because the cedar itself, the cuts that can be kind of harsh. The cuts are covered up with, with the intestine. How did you create the seams? How did I create the seams? I sew the intestine while it's wet. I, because once it's dry, it's the crumbles. It, you, can't, you can't pierce it, you can't really uh, work with it while it's wet. Uh, and, uh, and then while it's wet, I wrap it around, and then I keep sewing the next one, next one. And I wanted the intestines in part because, you know, every time I have a semi-truck of cedar coming in, I say, all right, Ursula, and off, and off of the cedar. Uh, so I wanted something almost on the level of something that was distasteful or disgusting, but it ended up being so beautiful. I mean, ended up being sort of really rich lace-like. So it's strange where you can find beauty, but that's the thing. You never want to predict too much stereotypically where beauty is. Um, and I'm still looking for other materials, but I have to say the wood has served me really, really, really well. So why don't you go around to the small room and you'll see the paper pulp pieces and then I'll meet you in the other room. I spent three months in Rome. They have an Etruscan museum that is marvelous. And there's something about the Etruscan culture that is like none other. You know, you see tombstones of a man and his wife, and he'll embrace her, and they're lying, you know, with their feet up and their feet, you know, together, like they're really, I mean, you can see smiles like gentle, gentle smiles on their face and real affection between the two of them. It's almost, un or I, it's not a usual thing at all, you know, that one sees that kind of monumentalized, you know, one that one sees that in 
in, in, in sculpture. Uh, so there they had tremendous uh, sort of displays of um, necklaces. And the necklaces there were threaded with wire that went through, but the wire was very jaggedy. It wasn't like our necklaces that all seemed to lie smoothly, you know, on our bodies. This was, you know, erratic, and it was sort of, you know, wandering in its own ways. It wasn't sort of predictable from small beads to big beads. Or, so I think it was not long after I saw that that I made this one. And of course, this isn't a necklace. And of course, this isn't a collar. I call this a collar. Uh, and sometimes you, 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 you put titles to things because you know, uh, you know, you don't know what else to call it. I don't want to have untitled, you know, 207 or something. I don't want that. So this pigment that I have, and you can see a little bit of green. It's the pigment that I bought when I came back from Rome. I, I, I had a suitcase full of pigment that had blacks that are earth connected with greens and with deep browns and with uh, colors that felt less harsh than the blacks that we make here in the United States. Because many of our blacks start with purple. Every, every black starts with a color. And the purple chemical blacks are, don't feel the same. So anyway, this is with that, I just mix that pigment with water and then spray it with a fixative that comes from seaweed. Um, any questions about this one? About the previous one, I'm sorry. Sure, sure. Um, curious as to if there was a reason why you didn't use graphite or any pigment? Okay, why I didn't use any pigment or any graphite? I just didn't think it needed it. You know, I thought it had a really good profile without it. And I don't even know if I can sort of have a clear reason as to why I didn't. Uh, there were other questions that were here that um, were asked of me. Yes. Is there, uh, you mentioned three different things, cedar, lace, and cow intestines. Is there any between th those three points of reference? Is there a connection for you? Is there, is that part of, a, of that myth that, of how you interpret the objects? Is that part of a what? A uh, you were you were talking about myths, the myth about a farmer's uh, blade or oh, something like oh, that. Is see. there a relation <laughs> between those, the the the, the, lace, the, the wood, and the? Um, is there a relation between the lace and the wood? I don't know, except that the lace is made out of wood, and the lace is really lace to begin with. You see, mm -hmm. it gets complicated. I mean, I can go on and on. But mm -hmm. I don't know whether I could really, you know, answer the question of that relationship in a way that would make a simple equation. Mm -hmm. But obviously those are things that I'm extremely attracted to. And then when you look at my work, you know, there's something about the work and its connection to fabric, not always, but, you know, sometimes, that I, I'm enamored of, but I, I have no idea, I mean, I really don't know why. Yeah. So the question is, is, is do, do I have any ideas of making tapestries? It's not a bad idea, but I think that there's something about, because I did knit once, you know, and there's something about the even stitches that you have to work with. And I knit a sweater, and you know, I got so like restless with it that I actually kept knitting it, and it was this awful color. It was like this off yellow. You know, I kept knitting it <coughs> almost all night, you know, but I just hated it so much. Anyway, I never finished it. I think I was knitted everything but one sleeve or something like that. But there's something about the, the unit of knit pearl, and there's something about the unit that you have to use of the wool or the thread that you use to make a tapestry. 
something about that stitch unit, you know, that I have a hard time working with. But I've never really moved it, you know, so I don't know for sure. Because I know you can change that unit, and I know you can make some of the parts of the, you know, whatever thread you use thicker and thinner and so on. Yeah. Do you have any idea where you developed your love for wood? Do I have any idea where I developed my love for wood? I don't know if I can answer that clearly either, but obviously, I don't, I don't know if I really love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say your association. <laughs> I mean, you should see the mask I wear to protect myself from it. But you do it. Weighs 15 pounds. I do it because I love, I mean, the love, that's a good thing. It's a stupid word. You are, no, it's another baby, word. Because I seem to need, need to make sculpture. Yes, I And do. that I seem to communicate best with the cedar. I seem to commu I seem to uh, say most closely what I need to say with the cedar. And I've used other woods too. They really suck, you know, in the sense that they're either too too hard, too tough, too much grain. Uh, so the cedar, see, you look at that, you don't think of grain, right? Even though it's open, it's not it's not graphite. So it seems to fulfill something <laughs> that I can't let go of, and I still seem to find things. I have I have now pieces in my studio that I just made the last year that are quite you know, different. I mean, I, I, I'm finding that it doesn't end, you know, in terms of what I can unearth through the cedar. Yes? On this piece, I'm trying to figure out what came first, the spray painting, because the top of the protruding pieces don't have the paint on them. Well, the paint comes very, very end, mm -hmm. and, I, and I actually paint it with water and pigment. Uh, and I think it would get getting more water as it gets to the bottom. Mm -hmm. No, I don't, I don't want to make like a complete anything in terms of, uh, see, I, 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 you know, if, if my work started to look too designy, I'd just put a bullet in my head. You know? <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, I have a terrific respect for really good design. But I don't have a terrific respect for things like, uh, let me see, I don't want to insult anybody. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> Go ahead. There's a piece I made for um, Microsoft that's a rather large piece, it's 66 feet. It's the only outdoor piece that they have. It's in Seattle, right near Seattle. <clears throat> it's on their campus. And there's a kind of suburban, young campus mediocrity that all of their architecture is. And they're neat freaks, you know, about their gardens. That is that, and they're not poetic gardens, they're not poetic, they're just neat freaks. You know, so they do things to my piece, like make this white, huge pebble rug all around it that's six feet wide on one side and six feet wide on the other side. It kind of swallows the whole thing up. So I guess it's like the suburban neatness, you know, <laughs> that sort of spots things in a, in a package that is so visually boring. All right, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask something? Yeah. So in this room you have this outside scale, even though you make reference to collar and maybe necklace, but not really the true description, the vessel, huge plates again. Do you, how, do you, how do you react to the interpretation of this sort of scale and um, your comment that, uh, or how would you re re react to the comment on you know, the scale of the gods, sort of, you know, that these, these enormous pieces, but in this particular room, you can actually see things that we know to be practical, such as a bowl or a plate or maybe a necklace. How do you react to, oh, it's this, this outside scale. Is there something to that, or is there nothing really to that? Well, I hope there's something to yeah. that outside scale. Yeah. But do you take it to an imagination of, like, I, I almost see something like this. You place that next to Stonehenge, and you now have somebody really questioning what was going on. You know, and, and where your imagination maybe is taking you. 
from anatomy. And there's a lot I use from the way animal joints, you know, work, or the way bones work, or the way. Not that I copy it in any way, but somehow it, I, you know, it gets drunken in and it comes through the sieve of my brain in a whole other form, but I think it is in form with those things. Any other questions? Yeah. Are, are the pieces on the floor, or is there a special platform, or how do you work? When I work? When you work. I think I spend about a third of my life on scaffolding. And my guys built the scaffolding and it's built out of cedar. We used that cedar again for, uh, for um, making sculpture. In fact, I'm having a birthday party coming up in which we're going to be making, it will be like 130 people, which we're going to be making long tables and benches out of cedar. And then I'm going to be using that cedar again for making my sculpture. But you had another question. I got it. Sorry, you? Yeah. Uh, the other question was the cutters, are they um, artists or are they just carpenters? Uh, they're not just carpenters. They're really special, special guys, especially the cutters. It takes a real, a real courage to do the kind of cutting that we do for my work. Uh, and there's a tremendous devotion on the part of them to meet the needs of them. Uh, I not only pay their salary, but I also give them their medical coverage. Uh, we watch out for one another in almost every way. If someone gets sick, or if we're, we're like a family. We sometimes go to places to install where we stay for three months at a time. We live with one another. I have somebody, a volunteer, that comes in and she graduated from a culinary, a French culinary institute, who cooks for me, lunches for my guys, and we eat together every day. <coughs> I see them much more than I see my husband. <coughs> uh, that it's a relationship that needs to be one where the egos all get tucked in, where the work is the most important thing. The artwork is the most important thing. We clearly understand it. And the installers that we had with Albert, and obviously really including Albert, also understood that because they're professional installers. Uh, a reason why it was such a pleasure to be installing with them. That they know that the artwork takes priority in safety. You know, they had a lot of weights they had to negotiate. You know, never mind the challenges, you know, with the lighting, but that's nothing but the another story. But it's, uh, you know, my, one of my guys have been with me for 16 years, and another one has been with me for, I think, eight or nine. It's uh, a relationship where, where there's a lot of, a lot of real care that we take of one another. And it's not mushy, you know, it's not like personal. It's, but it's very professional and very um, productive. How did you How find did you them? Find them? <laughs> That's just what I was going to say. Yeah, okay. yeah okay. they're wonderful. How did you find One of them came to me because I used to teach at Yale for all, a long time, maybe 10 years. And then I used to get from Yale a lot of guys that also knew tools and that knew the pragmatics of you know, working. And one of them now is, <clears throat> I had as a studio head for about six years, who is the brother of the one who's with me now, who's a terrific Sean. And then the other one, uh, I worked with him on a project in Sebastopol, California. Fantastic. Uh, and I hired him from that project because I needed somebody. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I, I, I have to know what they look like before I hire them. The, it, nothing comes, the buyer doesn't come, what, what comes is how they mm -hmm. feel. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. Have you ever collaborated with artists outside your medium? I collaborated once with somebody named Jimmy Fast. She's a friend and I have tremendous respect for her work and I like her enormously. 
the only time I've ever heard of her. Was she a painter? Or? She's a painter, but she she does drawings. She also does sculptures, just three dimensional things. But she's a real pro at printmaking and a drawing and a painting, more so than the sculpture. What work did you produce with her? It's a piece that's. Um, it was just put on my website, and it was um, on Canal Street. They had a place called the Laboratory that they put on. It started a little itty bitty place. It ended up getting some publicity, and um, somebody excavated it now, so that the Art 21 people that did the the public television yes, uh, yeah. Yeah, program uh, on my work have added that to the Art 21 section. And it's just so, um, this happened in 1983, something like that. But it is so, it just looks so um, ancient and so cute. So like an old <laughs> film, black and white. But it's, it's, it's kind of nice. So we made that piece of it. So you can see it there. <coughs> But she's somebody who pirouettes in the air. You know, her work is like exhaling with your breath. With, you know, all these things appear. They're very, very thin lines and energetic, energetic. And I have this huge slab of cedar that first thing she did when she we we shared a studio. She was below me, and I was above. Is she drilled holes in my piece? like six holes and she put it on feet, you know, on, on pipe, on these thick pipes. And it was kind of a beautiful piece, you know, so she danced above this big, thick slab of what I consider like a birth, you know, like a very great age. It was a lot of fun. But I feel like I have to really know the person and really like their work. So thank you so much. Oh,